All right, everybody, welcome back to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time we have some of uh, my very favorite Canadians on, uh, on the line to talk about the work that's being done by a group of volunteer data scientists in Ontario um, around COVID and driving some data transparency and some really wonderful data analytics um, to help drive um, and help fight the battle with COVID-19 up here in Canada. So I'm going to let Farabad and Guillaume introduce themselves and we'll have live Q&A at the end. If you're streaming, if you're watching this via any of the streaming um, outlets, we will aggregate those questions and um, post them to the, the speakers at the end of this. So without any further ado, Farabad and Guillaume, please take it away. Amazing. Thanks, Diane. So I'll introduce myself first. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Farbad Abu Hassani, and I'm one of the uh, website development leads for the How's My Flattening project. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let Guillaume introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Guillaume Moutier. I'm a senior principal technical evangelist at Red Hat in the cloud storage and the data services business unit. And I'm working mostly on data science platforms and data engineering and everything that relates to, to data. Back to you, Farbad. Amazing. Um, so how, we'll, um, how we're going to do this is uh, I'll have a quick slideshow uh, to tell you guys about the work we've been doing. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that Dem uh, Guillaume will take over from there and uh, have a couple more slides and then a demo of everything. Without further ado, let's talk about uh, how's my flattening. So to give you some context, I mean, um, we're here in Ontario, but I'm sure depending on where everyone's from, similar kind of context. Uh, this all started back in March uh, with the whole pandemic situation on the rise. Um, you know, we're looking across to uh, Europe and seeing, you know, all the issues that they were having. Um, and back here, uh, nothing had changed. You know, some of our, um, some of the team uh, is physicians in the hospital. We got kind of quite a big, uh, varied team that I'll talk about. But, you know, things were operating as normal. And uh, there was this big concern looking um, into how things are going, like how are we actually going to get action? So the, the, let's go to the problem statement. So we knew COVID was coming, right? We, we could see that from the European example. And the, the, the normal state of things here in Ontario, and it may be the case in, uh, I imagine, many kind of healthcare state of things, is that there's lots of data and it's not in one place, right? So some comes in PDFs. The government has started reporting some uh, stats on the website. It's a frozen, you know, you get out your, Ontarians, get out your spreadsheets and start writing this down every day if you want to get a sense of what's happening. Um, any analysis that happens in healthcare tends to be, you know, one-off analysis. Um, speed is a huge issue where things take weeks, if not months. Um, and quite honestly, we've given what was happening in, in Europe, we were scared of what was going to happen here if we didn't do something about it. So what happened is uh, we put together a team, you know, like uh, Diane mentioned, it's largely volunteer-driven and kind of a community approach of, okay, let's see what we can do, uh, leveraging technology. Um, to, to help um, and contribute in some way. So what we did um, is we actually got together. Um, we're quite a diverse set of people. So it's a group of right now uh, over 100, you know, people with different backgrounds, engineers, computer scientists, we got clinicians, we got epidemiologists. And, you know, we're all together to collect data, um, analyze it, and make it available to both uh, the public and to do analysis to inform decision making uh, to be able to better guide the, the response to COVID-19. Um, so some of the, the problems that we're solving for from the previous slide is uh, around real-time data viz. Uh, so, you know, having data pipeline, proper data pipelines, not someone just in Excel, um, doing proper live visualizations that are connected to a database, um, doing this all in a kind of agile manner that doesn't take months. Uh, because we didn't have months back in back in March, um, and then doing this all under a scientific process where you know we we do it in a peer reviewed kind of way where there is experts in epidemiology, medicine, and data science who sign off on everything we do. Um, so we're not just some guy on the internet. You can you can trust the analysis we produce. So let's talk about what we actually did. Um, Part of the challenge I mentioned is the data wasn't in one place. So the first thing we did is we put it all in one place, right? So we're gathering data 
uh, from uh, lots of different sources, so both looking at Ontario-specific data, Canadian data, and then also international data. And then that data is, of course, uh, kind of in different categories, so it covers everything from your typical case data to more interesting, more unique, I would say, around mobility, some economics data that we're adding. Um, so the goal is to have one site where researchers and others who want to do analysis have to use the data and find it, so you don't have to look over all over the internet. Um, and it's all vetted, so it's not, we, we trust the data we put there, um, so you can trust uh, the process there. So what came from that data is, of course, the analysis bit. Um, so one way we present this analysis is we have 37 regional dashboards. So one is looking at, you know, all the key, uh, all the KPIs for Ontario. And then in Ontario, we have regional health authorities, uh, which are called public health units. Um, so we made a dashboard for each of the public health units, right? Because before, each public health unit was trying to make their own dashboard. They all looked different. Um, and if you lived in Ontario, you had to figure out where to go. This is one resource you come and you find the data that's relevant to you. Um, what we do on top of that, um, outside of just the, the dashboard, is kind of more deep dive analysis as well. Um, so we have 14 plus analysis on the website. Um, going back to how we solve for it, these are not uh, static images. These are actual live interactive visualizations that are rerun and connected to a database. Um, I'll talk about kind of how it works in a bit, um, but that's kind of how we're different is not doing, this is not an Excel shop. Um, we're doing things that are, you know, of a low to medium technical sophistication, if you want. Um, this is just to highlight one of our analysis, you know, uh, this is kind of a new thing that we did that we're looking at. Um, the point is uh, to be able to monitor different things uh, that are happening in the pandemic. So one thing that we recently caught is that there has been a shift in trend in the age distribution of cases, right? So this would not be possible if someone was running this analysis every day, because we have you know, 15, 16 different things we're doing, and we're not a, um, we don't have the resources to man that. So it's all automated to, to the part that it can be automated. Um, so that's kind of, and honestly, if, uh, I, I imagine most of the people on this color are fairly technical people. Um, this is not a technical problem that we're solving. It's just unheard of in the space that we're doing it for some reason. Um, so it's just kind of catching up with, uh, with the industry, if you will. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the how. Um, we use two different uh, kind of visualization software for our website. The analysis page is mainly in Tableau. Um, the reason for that was, quite honestly, we had uh, people who were Tableau people, like data viz folks, um, and we didn't want that burden of coding to be on the, on the engineering team, if you will. So that part is uh, mainly done in Tableau. How it actually works, we had to go through uh, lots of hoops to make Tableau uh, update live. Uh, basically, the only way you can do it in a reasonable manner uh, for it to also be public um, is to use Google Sheets. So right now what happens is our data from the database, uh, the back end is updating Google Sheets every day at different intervals, and then Tableau is connected to that. So Tableau does the refresh from Google Sheets. There's, believe it or not, no direct way of connecting Tableau to a database of any sort or an API or anything. So Google Sheets is your way if you want to have a public thing. Um, but it works, and that's kind of, kind of how we're operating. The other bit is Plotly. Um, the reason for this is the standard language and you know for data science folks. Uh, it's open source, so there's no licensing cost. Um, so that's kind of the, the the reasoning for it, and it's quite simple, and everyone knows how to use it. Uh, so our dashboarding is mainly in Plotly, um, whereas the analysis page uh, the Viz team makes in Tableau. And of course, I'll talk about the OpenShift in a second. So um, our architecture is now, uh, thanks to the team over at OpenShift, has been containerized and moved over. Um, so, you know, we have your typical standard pods running. Uh, we have different staging and production and development environments. Um, and then, of course, we have cron jobs that run for the data pipelines um, that go to all the different data sources that we have and update the database, um, which, as I mentioned, then updates the visualizations, uh, whether it's through Plotly, which directly interacts with the database, or through the Google Sheets workaround. Um, the other how that I wanted to mention, again, this is thanks to the amazing engineers uh, from Red Hat, shout out to Olu and Steve, um, who made this happen, is we have, we moved actually our entire code base, we started in GitHub and we moved it to GitLab, um, and now we have GitLab runners that integrate with OpenShift, so, you know, when there's this code pushed, we have a fully connected CI/CD pipeline that um, uh, builds the image on OpenShift, 
um, applies a template um, to build the image and figure all the resources and you know um, do all the fun Kubernetes stuff um, to make sure it gets deployed. So it's quite literally, you've got a new branch, it gets deployed to a development environment, you can play around with it. Uh, you merge it into staging, staging gets updated, all the good stuff there. So that's that's been quite amazing. Um, I know Guillaume's talking more about the open data stuff, uh, the how behind that. Um, but it's been amazing to move to um, OpenShift and take advantage of all the of all the great benefits of Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, I'll talk a bit about our team. I mentioned we got quite a diverse group. Um, again, it's largely volunteer driven. It's uh, I would say this is kind of very new for me as well in the sense that we're trying to do an open source, open community bit um, with a lot of folks that are not software folks. So uh, we have a lot of clinicians. We have Epi kind of researchers, a lot of MD grad students, um, and we're trying to kind of onboard them into this whole GitLab open source approach and uh, teach them about, you know, a lot of the things that are normal, I guess, in the open source community, you could say. Uh, but it's been quite amazing as well. But I mean, it comes with its challenges, right? Um, so some of the challenges actually that we've been experiencing. Um, Ontario has quite discordant data, so when you build all these automated data pipelines and cron jobs that update the database, things break quite often, and some things we can predict and some things we, we can't, so we have to kind of build up on top of it. Uh, so this is a, a, an example, you know, you're looking at the accurate episode dates column in the, that the government releases, and all, they put like things that don't make sense, right? So there's things like 2002, like obviously no one got COVID in 2002, or it's highly unlikely. Um, most likely 2020, um, or accurate episode date of 12 a.m., right? Like stuff like that, which are really basic stuff that can, that if we don't see it coming, it breaks things, and then our vis are not updated, and you know, all the implications of that. Um, so we've been kind of iterating and building in uh, like basic additional logic to kind of filter some of this stuff out. Um, again, not a technical challenge, more just a maturity challenge. We've been building the bicycle and riding it, if you will. Um, so we're, we're growing, and there's some growing pains for sure. Um, I'll briefly talk about what's next. So we got two really exciting uh, things that I'm personally excited about. Um, one is we're, you know, I mentioned we have three seven plus dashboards. Um, there's a lot of data there. We're working on a scorecard um, that translates that data for the public, if you will. So simple kind of red light, green light, yellow light. Um, picking five key metrics we think are really, really important to focus on, and then seeing an easy kind of breakdown of it. So this is going to be our new homepage, so this is what we're actively working on. And then another bit, which Guillaume is going to go into, Open Data Hub, um, which is going to be amazing, amazing, amazing. I know the whole team is excited about it, uh, which is where we're going to, as we get access to more secure data that not everyone can have access to and there's contractual obligations with it, uh, this will be our solution where we can figure out the... Um, access management and how you have different people access to different groups of files and you know building in all our pipelines is something that is easy to use because as I mentioned a lot of our users are um, not extremely technical folks um, so this kind of removes a lot of the complexity um, which is we're really really excited about and I'm excited for them to talk more about it as well um, I'll briefly talk about the response um, as I mentioned this is largely volunteer driven um, we've been getting picked up uh, in the news a few times. There's been, uh, you know, some validation. For those of you who are not mentioned, who are not familiar with any of these articles, um, the Star is kind of the, the Toronto Star is a, a is a big deal here, if you will. It's the our equivalent of the New York Times. Um, so we got picked up by them, and there's been some uh, university-specific publications. But honestly, the the big thing for us has been this slide. I think this is what gives drives the whole community. Is on our website we have a chat bot. Um, and through the chatbot, anyone can kind of tell us how they feel about it, uh, about the work we're doing. Um, there's like a five-star rating review, and then people can submit specific feedback. Um, and I'm just leaving it on the screen here for a couple seconds while I'm talking. I hope you guys are able to uh, just read through a few of them. Um, honestly, this has been what's driving the passion uh, of the volunteers here is the, the positive feedback that we've gotten from the public, right, uh, in terms of making it more accessible, allowing people to know what's going on, people feeling like they need access to transparent data that may be lacking in other ways, it's just providing them with a resource, right? That's what it's all about. Um, I'll, at the, almost at the end of the presentation here, the last two slides here are around um, call, to, call to action. We really need more help. 
So if you're on this call, if you're watching this, um, whether it's today or some point in the future, please go to our GitLab. The link is at the bottom of every slide here. So gitlab.com, how's my flattening? Um, but please, um, I'm sorry, one second. I just got a call. Um, so please do go to our GitLab and get involved. Um, and you can just find it at gitlab.com, how's my flattening? We can use any help that we can get. Um, and everyone can contribute. Uh, we have lots of different things you can get contribute to, uh, so please do get involved there. Um, I usually have a slide for, um, like I mentioned, most of our uh, group is non-technical, so this is what I usually show to show them what, what the hell GitLab is and what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I imagine most people are familiar, but they're bored, so you can figure out what working group you'd like to get involved with. Um, that's it for me. In summary, we're, you know, we're a small organization, uh, largely volunteer-driven. Our goal is to show the value of open data and analytics and you know, an open community, open source approach uh, to move quickly to generate health insights and putting them all in one place to help inform both decision makers and the public. Um, and it's been, maybe I'll, I'll do a bit of a transition here. I think our, our, what we do and what our vision for how analytics should be done it quite nicely aligns with Red Hats um, and the, the company and what their mission is about. Um, so it's been amazing being able to collaborate with some of the folks on this call, um, you know, Guillaume um, and, and folks from Red Hat, Diane included. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Guillaume um, to talk about the Open Data Hub, uh, which is quite, quite exciting. Thanks a lot, Farbad. And uh, as you all have seen, um, the, the, the effort that is made by this this community of, uh, of researchers, of data scientists, of students, and everyone that is involved in the community is is really really important, and, and that's exactly why at Red Hat and in the Canadian Red Hat community we wanted to help, we wanted to do our share of helping this community build and grow. So what I will uh, talk to you about now is the, is the next step. I, I would say where the, where we can help this community with the data science platform that uh, that they want to build. Because as you've seen, as the number of people who are helping on this um, uh, on this website are, <laughs> and what's more important on the data analysis and uh, and all the stuff going around. As this team is growing, they they they, they have more needs to be able to 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 have working environments, especially, especially shared environments where it will be easy for them to collaborate, to exchange ideas, to exchange data or other resources. And as Farbon mentioned, they, they also have this, uh, uh, this, this need of, uh, of managing different access levels uh, because they, they have some more restricted data sets, of course. Uh, you know, some may contain uh, personal information or sensitive information. So th those are the, the requirements they, 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 that we talked about uh, with the team uh, and we, uh, we discussed how we could help them get to this, uh, this next level in terms of, uh, in terms of platform. So, our answer to that uh, was uh, leveraging Open Data Hub. Uh, Open Data Hub, for those who don't know, is, uh, is a project at Red Hat. It's, it's not a product, it's a, it's a project that uh, showcases very well how you can deploy data science platform on top of OpenShift. So it's a kind of a meta operator that allows you to very easily deploy some of the commonly used uh, data science tools uh, out there. Uh, so, you know, Jupyter Hub Notebooks or, or Kubeflow Pipelines or uh, uh, Seldon for serving models. Uh, so it, 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 this is all the, 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 the stuff that we can deploy uh, right now through Open Data Hub. Of course, it's not everything that was uh, that is uh, that is deployed right now uh, for House My Flattening. It's mostly uh, at the moment uh, Jupyter notebooks and shared uh, data uh, data workspaces. But it's as a summary, it's about getting getting from there. You know, each data scientist having its own in install in some installation of uh, Jupyter and the, the, the libraries that are needed and the data sets and stuff like that. So getting from this world to this one, where on top of OpenShift, you are able to run Jupyter Hub, which will uh, gives you access, to, which will give you access to, uh, to notebooks, to easy to use environments. And on top of that shared environments with a very efficient use of resources and, uh, and all the management that goes with it.
okay um what uh, I, I used also in this setup is uh is Ceph. uh it's uh rook Ceph that is deployed in this uh, in this installation because it allows us to uh, to have uh different types of storage that we will be able to use in our environments we needed block storage to create uh, pvs for the users so that means each user is able to have its own environment to store its own uh, its own data or files but at the same time we needed files uh we needed um uh, shared data so as rooksaf and, uh, and ocs are providing uh shared uh, file storage with uh, through CFFS, the, those allows us to have RWX PVs that can be mounted inside all the pods. And we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll show you in a few minutes uh, how it works. So that's the environment. I will close this and show you how it works. So I have created in, uh, in, in the project, I have created different uh persistent volume claims for shared data with uh, different access levels private public secret i have another one here for public notebooks and all those pvcs are using this storage class rook uh, rook ffs which allows us to have this three uh no it's not not selected the right one sorry for example for these shared data private uh, pvcs it allows us to to re to use this uh, read write many access mode so that means that several containers several pods will be able to mount this this share simultaneously okay um what is also interesting is that as you see, that's the new way uh, to deploy Open Data Hub. We are using the Kubeflow uh, definition files, and that's what is interesting is in this way it's very easy to deploy overlays. And in this case, I have created this overlay, which I called uh, shared PVC, and an overlay is basically saying, oh, in this specific configuration of the deployment, you will do a replace with this value, and here. I have the code in a more uh, readable uh, highlighting. So this code basically just say, whenever you want to spawn a new pod, you will look into the, the user lists, private users and secret users. Uh, if there are admins, they will also have read write access for on those shared folders. And you would mount, you would happen some configuration where you are able to mount uh, the, the persistent volume claim, for example, here, the shared data public directly inside the pod, okay? That's the technical part. I'll do a special session uh, on this uh, at some point, but let us see how it works. So let's say I'm a data scientist. I'm part of uh, the, the How's My Flattening initiative. I will have access to uh, to my environment through this uh, through this uh, launch uh, launch board, and I will just launch my Jupyter environment. It will require me to sign in. Here I have some credentials that I can use, and in this example, I will launch uh, a notebook which comes with the SciPy libraries, the Python SciPy libraries, and also comes with R, the R engine, because that was one of the requirements from the, from the team to be able, also able to use R notebooks. So again, this is a customized version that I that that I created because that's that's quite easy to do uh, from uh, Open Data Hub. You can create your own images, and here I can select my deployment size. Uh, so that means that the size of the pod uh, I will I will create. I could add some more environment variables, and then I will just spawn it. It will take uh, a few seconds and. Meanwhile, we can see what's happening under the curtain. And here you can see I have here Jupyter Hub Notebook with my uh, login name and I have the container creating. Okay. And I guess it's almost running. Yes, it has pulled the image. And then I, uh, I am in my environment. 
here you can see there are some stuff that I created myself I have this folder here uh, our demos and uh, our packages that I installed uh, so let's say here I open this notebook so that's my environment where I'm able to work and that's uh, the simulation I, I have run based on the notebook that the, 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 the team provided to me but on top of this personal environment I would say I have access now to a shared data folder so this shared data folder is the same one that everyone who's using the environment will be able to see and here I, as I have those uh, special access I have access to private and uh, secret folders but normally you know standard people part of the initiative will only see the, the public folders and that's where the public folder that's where they will find you know some data sets that they are able directly to to use uh, with their notebooks so that's a very neat way to provide people with shared data that they can directly use inside their environments and we have also created a shared notebooks environment and far about yesterday created this uh, welcome notebook okay just to explain how it works and to give some uh, some uh, demonstration on those shared data uh, that uh, that are accessible by by everyone okay so that's about it for this presentation it's uh, again it's a standard open data hub deployment uh, you know first base uh, with uh, jupyter hub maybe we will deploy other stuff uh, in the coming weeks uh, but that's a, a very interesting implementation uh, especially with those shared data and shared notebooks uh, that are very easily done uh, with the rwx uh, capacity that we have in uh, in rooksf or openshift container storage and that's all for me all right um so uh as a canadian and i think both farabad and guillaume as well we're we're all very excited about this project happening and and how um it's unfolded very very rapidly there's there's one question um and I, it gives me a good segue to um how to get involved and i'm going to share my screen for a second just so that i can put up the the gitlab um, page here on how is my flattening and you can tell me if you can um, see if you can see my screen that would be great so um, the one question was um, that's come in from twitch just while we were while you all were talking was about um, why did we um, decide to use GitLab or why did why did Farabad maybe you have a, a some insights into this but um, while, while we're talking about it, if you are looking here, the URL is here for, for How's My Flattening and how to get involved and, and how to get um, started in using some of the projects here. And um, Farabad, do you have some insights into, um, and I have tons, but about, about why you decided to use GitLab and, and how yeah, that came sure. So So when we started the project, like I mentioned, we have, um, we have a bit of a different kind of open source community in the sense that it's not all uh, kind of your your technical folks that are usually involved with open source communities, right? Like it's not uh, the typical environment. So when we started, we were all over the place in terms of project management. So we had code sitting in in GitHub. We had uh, lots of Google Docs that we had in terms of documentation that we would send people. Uh, we had we used Trello for project management and keeping track of tasks. Um, we're all over the place in that sense. And when when we started working with uh, Red Hat, who were the, the Red Hat engineers that I mentioned, Olu and Steve, who were helping us move it, move over uh, to OpenShift. Um, it it kind of became the perfect opportunity for us to switch to GitLab in the sense that we wanted to, well, first of all, we wanted to use GitLab runners to do the, the OpenShift integration. I know there's different ways of doing it, but that was one way. Um, the other bit of it was that the nice thing about GitLab, other than it just being an open source project and you can deploy it, I mean, that's just a whole other thing. But it does everything in one place for us, which is nice, right? So we have our, I know some of these features are also available in GitHub. Um, it was just almost at that point a preference thing in terms of we got the wikis here, we can use issue boards to keep track of everything. Um, and then all the CD parts that come with GitLab, which were nice. Um, so that was part of it. Um, but it was honestly just a, it wasn't a, 
because of how small of an organization we are, we don't do proper uh, kind of when picking a library, like let's do an assessment of what's out there in the field, let's come up with criteria. And it's all like going back to the whole building the bicycle as we're riding it thing. It was a, uh, we wanted to do it, seem like a good way of doing everything in one place. So that was kind of the big decision and the reason for the move. Yeah, I, I think um, like I, I've been involved, I don't know, maybe a month. I don't even know this it's been 60 days the whole project so I, I don't know when I, I first twigged to what you guys were doing and when somebody reached out for some help uh, on doing this but the other the other piece of the puzzle is that um, the, this group of folks weren't really um, savvy about open source practices or you know you had you you were savvy about open data and uh, data privacy and all of those things you had a lot of experience some of the data scientists and analysts um, were really um, up on on all of that that side of the coin, but creating a community around this and like the pro different approaches to project management and how to make things open and one of like using GitLab or GitHub or anything and putting all of this out in the open was part of the the learning curve too I think um, and mm -hmm. GitLab gave us a very nice way to do that um, publicly and to start you know writing the onboarding documentation. Um, as a group and collaborating on that and getting that um, up and, and running. So that was um, that was an interesting thing to watch the phenomena of everybody um, piling on with, you know, thumbs ups and here's a link to another data source and all of this, and like the coordination um, that had to get assembled and take place um, and use and, and figuring out a way to um, to make that all public and, and secure at the same time. So. Um, some of the pieces of the project, like Tableau, are, are not open source software um, and needed licenses and stuff. So there were a lot of pieces along that line, logistics-wise, that we had to figure out, as well as um, what Guillaume has done um, with some of the Red Hat team, getting it up and running in a scalable way. Uh, so um, yeah, maybe they had to build on top of that. That, that was actually a really good point that I. That I actually forgot to mention in the presentation. Um, so we have a very small kind of technical team, um, and quite honestly, none of us had any experience with open source, um, like none, absolutely none. Um, so what? So that was another kind of I mentioned Olu and uh, Steve and obviously Guillaume, who were, who helped us move some of the the technical infrastructure and set it up on OpenShift. But the other really big part, like um, that, was just brought up is around the whole community aspect, right? Like that. What I think makes us different than just a website on the internet uh, where it's just one guy doing some analysis. Um, and we didn't know how to do that, honestly, right? Like we, we operated on Slack at first and we ran into this issue as more people came on board that the, the communication was getting very siloed, right? So a lot of conversations were happening in private chats between folks and to catch someone up, like literally we would screenshot conversations with other people just so you don't have to rephrase it. It's just like, just read the conversation I just had with other person. Yeah. Um, we had a whole challenge that, uh, that, that, that helped, that, that's another aspect that Red Hat helped us with. Um, Dan was one of the leads, um, along with, uh, damn, the name I'm thinking on here, Dan. Brian, Brian, uh, Brian Prophet. Right, Brian Prophet, yes, and along with Brian Prophet, who kind of helped us figure out how do we even, like, open source 101, how do we do this? Um, so that was another reason why we wanted to move to GitLab. So now it's, I guess we're, we're still building on top of it, so it's kind of becoming more and more of a community thing. But like anyone can go right now on our, on our GitLab, see all the issues, see all the discussions. Now it's not on private Slack channels. All the meetings, you know, when it happens, that's all documented. There's wikis for things. Now, you know, like how, do we, how does an analysis go up on the website? Before it used to be, I talked to three other people and they knew how it happened. But if someone just is joining the community, they have no idea, but now we publicize that, so it's not a black box of decisions being made. Um, and everyone gets transparency into it, which I think is part of what we're trying to do, which is another piece that uh, Diane and, and... All right. Sorry, another call, um, which okay. Diane and Brian have been having. I'm going to put my yeah. do not disturb on here. But, um, so anyways. I think the other interesting thing was um, once we were digging into, you know, uh, was how experienced some of the um, clinicians and, and basically their clinician data scientists and even your role, Farabad, is um, you know you've you've 
you, you and uh, like uh, Dr. Ben Fine and a whole bunch of other folks um, have this deep, deep knowledge of the, the data and the data sources and how to do the analysis. And then there was, uh, you know, so there were sort of these data scientist doctors or engineers um, that were volunteering their time and how to take advantage of that. And then there are all these other people who I kind of coined a uh, word data scouts, people who were finding data sources and then, you know, just posting them in Slack, which, you know, has all kinds of issues and stuff. So if you could talk a little bit about um, how, like you have all these disparate data sources, how you're um, aggregating them and bringing them together a little bit um, and make that, um, talk a little bit about where, how you're combining all those data sources into decent analysis. For sure, so um, how the website is structured, you'll see on the, on the right hand side of that GitLab there, there's four working groups, if you will. Um, there is the website development group, so that's the kind of more technical folks. Um, there is the data collection group, um, and that's some of, or the data scouting group, that's what, uh, some of whom uh, Diana is referring to. And that group has honestly been amazing. So we've done a couple of different projects, and I'll talk about them. One is, you know, there's 60-some medical students who are just volunteering their time, um, and other grad students, um, and quite literally just volunteers from the community who are uh, collecting a brand new data set that does not exist around non-pharmaceutical intervention. So, uh, what I mean by that is, you know, the government announces different policies in response to COVID. So order was shut down, schools were closed. There's no data source. Like if you want to find out when these things happened, you would struggle. To, like you have to basically Google it and read news articles and put date time, right? So what they're doing is they're actively monitoring across the country um, when all these regional, down to a regional level, right? Like city A versus city B, these announcements are being made. And um, there's a whole kind of, review process around it, um, and they built this whole group, right, just connect, collecting these um, this data set around non-pharmaceutical interaction. So that's been amazing. Um, maybe I'll speak a bit broadly outside of what we do just outside of the NPI, which is, you know, one whole project. Um, like Diane alluded to, there is lots of data sources that, that are kind of non-traditional and traditional. Um, so we have to come up with uh, what I would say creative ways of dealing with this. So some is you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, the government's, for example, posts, they have one page where every day there is an HTML table that they update with new cases. So we have like web scrapers that go every day like, through cron jobs throughout different points of the day and read off that table and capture it with a timestamp. Um, there's other data sources that come to us in more creative ways. So there's some reports that are PDF reports. So again, another convert this PDF into actually a usable format that people can just get a timestamp, um, like a time trend and a proper kind of actionable, like a, almost an Excel CSV, right? Like a CSV file um, and keeping historical trends of that. So there's been little mini pipelines built for each of these where it's a, this is our, our report PDF to database uh, pipeline. This is our convert the government website to database pipeline. There is the, there's also a few other kind of open uh, data groups that we leverage. Um, there's this uh, group called Canada Open Working uh, Data Group, if I'm not butchering that name, uh, led by Isha Berry, uh, who's, uh, and, and a few other um, others out of U of T. And that's another data source, uh, which we kind of use their CSV daily and update our databases. Um, so there's basically lots of data pipelines sitting and running throughout the day now on OpenShift um, that just go, go scour the internet, if you will, from all these different sources and update the database, which in turn um, updates that Google Sheets uh, workaround that I told everyone about, um, that then updates the visualizations, right? So if you go on our website, you'll see there's visualization on capacity, there is uh, trends in cases, there is RT, um, right? So those are all coming from, those pipelines are populating the database. And then again, daily cron jobs run that update either the Google Sheets, which is our um, medium, or um, if it's plotly, it's a direct to um, direct kind of query from the database that runs an analysis and updates it. Um, so that's high level uh, how everything works, and, uh, how it's connected to the data. Yeah, I think, and um, Guillaume and the team, you know, they've done, uh, you know, and this is not just, this is me as a Canadian saying thank you to Guillaume and, and the other folks for, for setting that all up and making that the automation happen. Um, to clean that data up and collect that data. It's been pretty, um, pretty amazing. 
So I'm wondering and, and, why. If I may, Diane, I guess you know what Farbot explained is it's the perfect demonstration of the struggling uh, that uh, data scientists or researchers are, are facing with the data, you know. And, and I, I, that's why I like this project because uh, uh, what we help do is exactly what technology and open source can bring to, uh, to, to the research world because, you know, we are – for us, it's pretty standard, you know, to have cron jobs running into containers and connecting to the data moving here and there. That's the kind of tools that research don't, researchers don't even know about. Okay, so here, bringing these technology skill sets that we were able to do directly to to, do, to this research is again the, the perfect demonstration on how uh, how I, I would say IT tools, you know, the standard DevOps uh, and uh, practices and the technology that we've been using for the past few years have definitely their, their place in modern, uh, in modern research, you know, especially when it's, uh, it's so uh, tied to, uh, to data. So I, I guess we have a perfect example, and I'm pretty sure that in the, the, the coming months and years, we'll see more and more of those techniques applied directly in other research projects, because it helps a lot. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of learning from each other and um, hoping to move forward in the, the battle against COVID. It's pretty amazing. Um, and a lot of the, the lessons that, um, that we're learning on, you know, and that we've done, I think, in the OpenDataHub.io project as well, um, sort of set us up nicely to be able to help Farabad and the team at How's My Flattening as well. So um, there's really, uh, you know, if any good outcome comes from COVID and all of the things here is the um, ab our ability to respond quickly using DevOps and using open source and using these models um, and the pre-existing stuff to, to help with pandemics and other emergencies like this. But it's also what's been really interesting to me is um, there had been prior to all the COVID stuff, a lot of conversations that I've had in the, um, the community with data scientists about how much, uh, and, and data scientists, they love their Jupyter notebooks. They love that. They don't love dealing with the infrastructure. And so the more we can just um, enable them to have like Jupyter Hub and their notebooks and their pipelines all hooked up, the better. Um, and the, the last thing we want them doing is, and I won't say wasting, but, you know, wasting their time, you know, setting up CI, CD pipelines, you know, deploying Kubernetes clusters and all of that. And so the more we can automate that and make that, um, uh, I hate the word turnkey, but I'm going to use it like a, a, just a solution that we can drop in and integrate in for whatever the training models, the training, the pipeline is for data, the better off um, we all will be. So I'm wondering. And, and, and in fact, you know, it's a little bit worse than that because, uh, uh, you know, without things like uh, Open Data Hub, uh, they, they won't even, you know, do themselves the CI CDs and the pipelines. They will do everything manually. You know, as, as Farbot described, you know, at the beginning, just grabbing the Google Sheets and then transforming them manually and stuff like that. So it's not even going to a very integrated step. It's just even the first step in using modern tools that is a, that is a challenge for, for, for most people. So if we can bring them directly to the, I would say, to the, to the top with this kind of automated tooling, well, that's for the best, I guess. Yeah, I think we saw that the same thing. There was another COVID project in Finland called FeverMap, uh, FeverMap.net, and there was the good thing about it was it was came out of a hackathon, and it was all most of it was developers, and they were applying it, and how quickly they were able to leverage the technology to move forward with their fever mapping project. So I think that's really uh, one of the keys here is where we. Um, the technology folks who all want to contribute and move this forward and fight the battle against COVID can actually contribute to this project. So if you're out there and listening um, and want to get involved, again, come back to um, the housemyflattening.ca um, GitLab page or their homepage where there are links to that and, and jump in. I wanted to ask Farabad as well and, and Guillaume um, as to where do you see this going after we, um, you know, the life for this project, how's my flattening, and the learnings going after this project? 
once we're beyond this. So, you know, for the wider impact at the province, um, in the province of Ontario, and um, I'm, I'm over in, I'll just put my, I'm in British Columbia over in BC, so a shout out to Dr. Bonnie Henry and keeping us safe out here in BC. Um, so where do you think this is all going to, and, and this learning that you've done, Parabod? Um, that's a good question, and I, I guess it kind of goes back to our mission, right? Like going back to what we want to do, is we want to be able to show the value of transparent data, community-driven analytics, right? Be able to, you know, what we're really pushing for is to change the, 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 the norm of how things are done. So going back to how things are done right now in healthcare analytics, um, it's very siloed. So there's different institutions that hold different data pieces. Um, and it's extremely difficult to share data um, because every institution is responsible for their data. And if something goes wrong in terms of sharing the data, then it's on them, right? So that's the issue. So data sharing is quite hard in Ontario. Um, and the people who have access to the data, you have to be, uh, you, you have to jump through a ridiculous number of hoops to get access to very, very basic data. Um, so it's not very open. Um, and that's honestly what we're trying to change. Like that's what that's part of our mission here. So you'll see, um, even that's that's part of what Open Data Hub is. I'm hoping will help us all for. Um, and let me talk about that a bit. So, like you mentioned, there is three buckets of access right now. There is the super secret bucket, the sensitive bucket, and then there's the public bucket, right? Um, so by de default, everyone has access to the public data, right? So I think we we should be able to put any data that's not at all compromising uh, patient information on that bucket. Um, but then there is a sensitive bit. So for example, there may be contractual obligations or terms of use. Um, and it's important that only certain people have access to it. But that doesn't mean that there, there should be a process set up for anyone to get access to it as long as they follow the terms of use, right? So that's, I guess, that that's a transparency bit that we're pushing for, that getting access to healthcare data should not be uh, there should not be a prerequisite to be a member of a private club to be a member of this to get access to healthcare data, right? There's, I think, a part of what we've been trying to show is a lot of our anal uh, a lot of our analysis on our site is done by uh, what the term we like to call citizen scientists, right? So non-typical uh, folks who would you probably honestly not have access to the data otherwise. Um, so I think that's a big thing we're trying to push for outside of COVID, outside of the pandemic, outside of the pandemic bubble, if you will, outside of the lifetime of this project, is making data more accessible to folks, uh, making it more transparent, um, and making you know making it more open, community driven, so people can get access to these things, and you don't have to be uh, a member of a specific club or a specific group to get access to it. Um, how open sh or how Open Data Hub is enabling that is because now we have this kind of secured access bit that we can use, then we can now put pipelines from the different buckets into each other, right? So there may be a, a data source that only a few people can get access to, but that doesn't mean aggregate data can't be accessed by more people, right? So now that we have this infrastructure, we can use Open Data Hub to give people access to aggregated data that no longer has that those issues around uh, privacy, um, around it, but it still makes the data transparent. It still makes it useful, because honestly, I think the thing that we're all trying to get to here is to get access to aggregated data. Kind of going back to the 80-20 bit, the thing that honestly makes a difference is usually aggregated data. We don't need patient level information for 99% of the things, right? So that aggregated data is the challenge, right? And that's what we're hoping to solve for with the Open Data Hub. Yeah. So I, I know I was in Slack the other day um, and having a conversation because uh, with all the the work going on um, around um, diversity and um, race and trying to track uh, COVID uh, based on you know ethnicity and um, diversity and all of that, one of the the issues I think that was flagged for me um, was the lack of um, metadata. You know, even in the aggregated data, uh, that was it was pretty lacking, at least for from from what I could see and what we were chatting about in the Slack um, around how was how did he put it? Is that the way that we uh, let, figured out whether it was um, ethnic or not was by the um, location, and it was yeah. as if an entire city was one ethnicity, and was like yeah. no 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 we we need to break it down a little bit better. So I think there's 
a lot of room for improvement um, in the the uh, also the, the cross mapping of different data sources. So when we have Stats, Stats Canada data on the population on, on that, and then we have the health, and there's a whole lot of work that still needs to be done um, in that space as well. So I, I think there's, like, we're going to have, a, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But what the, so. the, I think the thing that you guys have shown the light on is how these citizen scientists can help um, bring that um, to the front. Um, what is very encouraging has been to see uh, the Ontario province give thumbs ups and, you know, thank yous and respond positively as opposed to like trying to shut you down or anything like that to the work you're doing. And, uh, you know, a lot of that, I think a shout out to Dr. Ben Fine and his fine diplomacy skills and his influence um, with the different groups. He's done some amazing work um, getting, uh, getting us um, a little bit further in. So I, I'm... I'm going to, it's going to be interesting to see how all of these learnings and the collaboration between all of these different parties, because there, I mean, there's U of T people, there's folks from at least a dozen other um, companies and uh, partnerships that you guys have, you know, well beyond the Tableau and Plotly and GitLab stuff. There's, I don't know, like at least 10 or 20 different companies that are putting their resources and their time and effort into this project beyond, um, the, the ton, the army of um, students who have been coming in. Uh, I have seen so many uh, U of T, U University of Toronto, if you're not Canadian, U of T folks um, on this, uh, that it's, it's just amazing um, to see. And, you know, hopefully this inspires a whole nother uh, generation of people to uh, collaborate in the open um, and also um, to help um, in efforts and initiatives like this. This is pretty pretty huge, the stuff that you're doing, and it, it hasn't stopped yet. So um, it's if you're out there, you're listening to this, or you're watching it later on, um, and you can see that Farabad, I think, is like uh, a monster when it comes to this. You're always on online all the time. Everything you can see on this page that's up here it was last edited by Farabad a, a few uh, couple of hours or 20 hours ago, and th there's tons of folks. Um, uh, Spencer has been doing the community project management for this. Marlise, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are um, helping to make this thing happen. So it's it's certainly not a party of one. Um, and yeah, honestly, I think the the next step is to onboard the um, Ontario government um, in collaborating on this too. I think that'll be that'll be the fun the stuff. So, yeah. They're, they're coming. They're coming to the party, um, and you know this is this is another another um, adventure in open data too. So I think there's as we go through this and we see that you know the the screen scraping from government sites is one thing, but to actually have those data sources directly in the pipeline so you're not screen scraping would be awesome too. Yeah, I think that's kind of goes to what you're almost saying around how technology that's almost more than standard, right? We're kind of introducing into this field that does not use it, right? So I feel like that will hopefully also enable um, parties that are sharing data with us to feel more comfortable. Like I, I briefly talked about the, you know, different tiered access and using aggregation pipelines to make data more public, right? There should be no reason why some form of almost all data can be public. It doesn't have to be you know, the role level, it doesn't even have to be amazing aggregates, but some form of it uh, for everyone to have access to, because there will be, hopefully, as we're trying to show here, amazing analysis and insight generated because of the fact that citizen scientists can get access to it. Yeah. So I, I think that's the one of the lessons learned here is, is figuring out how to get the trust in the citizen scientists so that we enable the government to trust that you know we've we've got the right processes in place. We have the right um, security and privacy, and we're being compliant. We're not sharing data that we shouldn't. We're not accessing accessing data that we shouldn't. Um, we're ensuring everybody's privacy is respected, um, but also the power of the community to help um, find the anomalies, to help find the trends, to do the modeling. Uh, you know, every, we we've always heard about like uh, people looking out at data coming in from the universe and finding new stars and new planets and, you know, all kinds of interesting things there. 
but this is really pragmatic. This is affecting, and not that that space stuff isn't either, but this is really um, stuff that is life-changing and can really help um, figure out where we need to get more ICU seats and you know beds rather, um, new ventilators, where the curve is not flattening, where you know it's reoccurring. So the the pieces here really are um, life-saving efforts, and to be able to bring to bear all of these resources is a pretty amazing, um, and to do it um, in a way that um, everyone trusts the outcome. And I think that's the thing is that. Doing it in the open helps, uh, as we say in the open source, a little bit of sunlight goes a long way. Um, it's kind of the open the sunlight on the trans open data is great, but also it's a bit of a two-way street. You have to make sure you're compliant, you're respecting privacy and all of that, and that that's really you guys have done a very amazing job um, working through all of that. And I think that in part is because so many of the clinicians who are on here, and, and I'm completely impressed by the roster. If someone goes to the, the website and sees who's weighing in on this, it's it's not a, it, there are a lot of students, but it's not a student-driven effort. So there's some pretty senior people in the Ontario health system um, working on this, um, and doctors and clinicians who have, who really have been helpful and key to making sure that we um, uh, do everything up on the up and up and, um, not um, break any rules or regulations. 100 percent. So maybe I'll, I'll briefly comment on that last bit. I think that's that's a credibility challenge that I hope we're also solving for. Um, is because everything that we put on the site, whether it's a new data source or a new analysis, uh, signed off on by experts in the field. Like it's not some random person who's looking at this. It's all in the open, and you can see all the comments that get generated. Um, but you know, our, our leadership. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Ben Fine. Um, who's a who's a radiologist? Uh, who's a clinician? Um, also engineering background, amazing guy. Um, and then uh, Dr. Laura Rosella and Dr. Ali Veda Atenoy, um, who have different backgrounds, who kind of bring the whole package, if you will. So uh, Ben has that clinical background. Ali has the data science analytics background, and Laura um, has the epidemiology uh, and scientific expertise. And that kind of that that trio signs off on everything. Um, so we, I, part of what we're trying to do is not um, not be part of the hype, if you will. So we want our analysis to be actually scientifically sound. Um, so that's why there is, uh, on top of the open community bits, there is a rigorous process that we go through before anything gets added to the site. Because um, we do want to make sure that the science is there and it's not just hype on the internet. That's perfect. So Guillaume, um, we're, we're almost at the end of the hour, we're close to the end of the hour, or we're at the end of the hour, one of those things. Um, any last words about where you're thinking of, um, what you're thinking of doing next, what's on the roadmap next for Open Data Hub, and how is my flattening project, what's, what's up next? I, I, I guess uh, next what, uh, what we will have a look into is uh, maybe look at uh, the, the the Argo pipelines because uh, you, you know Farbod is doing uh, Farbod and the team uh, they, they are doing a lot of things uh, that are uh, related to, uh, to 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 this stream of workflows and automated workflows and treatment of data and stuff like that. So I guess that's the next thing we will uh, we will look into just to see if it fits their 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 needs. Uh, there's also the the, the Kubeflow pipelines that we want to look into, uh, trying to again, automate a little bit more what's being done, you know, going from notebook to fully automated data pipelines. That's the, that's what we'll, we'll look into in the, in the coming weeks. Cool. So with that, I'm just going to thank both of you very much for all of your efforts in this and the entire um, How's My Flattening team, which is getting bigger every day and hopefully um, we'll get a little more awareness out of doing this one and get a few more resources as well um, and more eyeballs on the project and continue to help um, the province of Ontario um, make their decisions based on um, good actual data um, and in real time as close as possible. So thank you again for all of your efforts, Farabad and Guillaume, um, thank you for stepping up and um, taking this on. So um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care guys.